Hi, Misha here, and if you have asked, and we really haven't focused on it in quite some time. So today, let's get into the Heckler & Koch, the German HK-33, and of course, its semi-automatic variant, the HK-93. We'll also talk about the HK-43 a bit. And how the original select fire never went into German service, but was never really meant to. And, you know, just in general, where this fits. Interesting piece, and it was actually in production for three decades. But it was always kind of the little brother, the in-between. And of course, it fires 5.56 originally. 223 and is a roller lock or roller delay blowback system just as the other HKs in the family. So why wasn't it as successful, at least for military clients? And uh, what did people think about it when these guns came in in the 70s and 80s? Well, we'll hang out, talk, do a little comparing as usual so on and so forth and as always invite you to uh, comment and share your own experiences and as always if you could please like share and subscribe and if you'd like to help support to the channel you can go over and check out patreon what we have here is actually quite an early hk 93 a2 and we have the 30 round metal mag, steel mag in it. And over here we have two 40 round alloys complete with HK coupler. Of course this is the wide forearm with bipod. This is the 16 inch version. Early imports actually had the 15.4. We'll get into that in a bit. But before we talk about the 43 and 93 let's talk about the 33 the select fire version as you know the whole roller delay system started off in uh, Germany with the STG 45M which was then transferred to Spain where set me with Vor Grimler really developed it into the model a becoming the model 1958 the model B and C the model 1964 those were all in 762 first 762 set me then 762 NATO. Of course, West Germany had been using the G1, a FAL variant, but that didn't go anywhere. They weren't going to produce it. So they would have trials, and they would select the G3, as it was known. It went up against the Swiss STG W57, the SIG SG510, and also the Armorlite, AR-10, but HK had been working with SETME for a number of years, and so it was a pretty foregone conclusion that G3 would be adopted, and it was, and it started a whole family of rifles. Now, interestingly, in the 60s, HK did not have exclusive rights at all. Actually, Rheinmetall also made G3s for the Bundeswehr. It wasn't until 1969 that Rheinmetall stopped making G3s. And it wasn't until the 70s when HK had full rights to the design. But nevertheless, as early as 1960, they started thinking about a whole family of guns. And doing them in multiple sizes, multiple calibers. And all would be essentially the same thing. You'd have a pinned-on rear stock. This is very similar to even the MP44. You'd have a lower housing, which would allow you to change out firing packs, modes. Of course, they'd feed from standard mags. These would all have stamped steel receivers with welding, which was technology that was evolved from World War II. And they would have appropriate length barrels for the rifles to launch grenades and have a bayonet, so on and so forth. 
So obviously the first cartridge, the first caliber in the family was the 7.62 NATO. The HK naming system, three basically meant rifle. So this is HK-33. I guess nominally the G3 could have been HK-31, although it's not really a name ever used. HK-32, so rifle, the two stood for the caliber of 762 by 39 which was created as a trials gun for places like Finland, who ultimately adopted the, the Valmet M62 as the RK-62. So that really went nowhere. Um, PTR has made, of course, their version in more recent years that America is a semi-auto. The HK-33 was the next member, and it was to be a rifle type, chambered for, at the time, the very new 223 round. Work began in 1964, ran through 65, and by that time they were ready to go, because again it's a known system. Of course you would also have the MP5 in this whole family, and uh, it would have a different naming system, initially called the HK-54, with 5 being for submachine gun size, 4 being for the 9mm, but this name was quickly changed to MP5 that we know and love. So in a lot of ways, <laughs> the name system really only stuck for the HK-33. Now, West Germany was using the G3 as a standard rifle. HK wasn't even going to try to make this. This was designed for export and to compete with other small diameter high velocity guns that were coming onto the market at the time. But there weren't many, not in 1965. But of course, it would go up against the original. In 65, the M16's full adoption by the American military was far from assured. But they were making progress with the XM16E1. But there was an effort to get the HK33 in. Specifically, Harrington and Richardson, H&R, worked a license agreement out with Heckler and Koch to produce a version in America known as the T-223. Essentially, German parts brought over and assembled here. And these would be trialed. In fact, some would even be sent for field testing in Vietnam. This would appear in the H&R catalog in 1965 and was almost identical to the standard German version, except they had a 20-round steel straight wall mag and they had a bolt hold, hold open system of a type built in. The standard kit was six 20 round mags, bayonet, bipod sling, and of course it had a 1 in 12 twist. Now the overall barrel length was 390 millimeters, so 15.35, or just 15.4. They could launch a rifle grenade. Overall length was just a hair over 36 inches. In the weight. The weight was about eight and a half pounds unloaded. Quite a bit more than an M16, M16A1 type. But they would try them out. There would be a slightly different version sent over in the hands of Navy SEALs that instead of being packed with 20 round mags would actually have 40 rounders and they would get four of these. Still more capacity overall and uh, yeah these don't really had a whole lot of extra weight even fully loaded unloaded because they're alloy they're actually lighter and at that time having a lightweight reliable 40 round mag was pretty revolutionary so that was one benefit the uh, German gun had 20 25 or 40 round capacity Whereas the M16 of the day only had 20 round mags. So would that be enough to kind of offset things? I should also point out that the roller system was quite reliable compared to the early direct impingements. Especially in places that were very wet, you know, around the water, that kind of thing. Even though field trials didn't go terrible for the T223, of course, as we know, it was not adopted. Aside from the weight, this is a much heavier gun. It's a more expensive gun. It's kind of funny to think that a stamped receiver 
but the technology, the time, the resources, I mean, just getting everything right. Yeah, it was more expensive, even for government. It was heavier. And, of course, it suffered from the not-made, not-designed-here. As much as the Colt M16 might have been an outsider to the crowd that loved the M14, this was doubly an outsider. Plus, it was a German gun, and while reputation for Germany was much better in the 60s than it was in the late 40s, you know, you get the idea. So, a very brief, lived thing. In 1967... The M16A1 was officially adopted, and also in 1967, H&R officially removed the T223 from their catalog, and that was it. What parts they had were just put in storage and were sold off over the years, and the final T223 parts were liquidated when H&R went out of business in 86. But uh, since the U.S. military, U.S. government wasn't interested, there was very very little reason for them to continue. Plus, by 1968, 1970, more and more 223 guns were coming online, like the AR-18. Soon Beretta would have their AR-70, so on and so forth. So, I just, I really thought that was a neat thing. I tried doing a clone of a T-223 years ago. It would have had the skinny handguard, not the wide but it did have the fixed early all plastic buttstock, that kind of thing. So, what about the HK-33, the select fire, and other militaries? It's about as good as it gets with the bipod and the 40 round mags on the table. Here's a closer look at these. I love these steel 30s. Like I said, there was also a 25 and even briefly a 20. Fun fact, these mags were so long that the Navy SEALs that had a few of these ended up having to steal some Chinese magazine pouches for the AK because uh, they, they couldn't find American web gear that would fit them. So HK officially unveiled the HK-33 in its 1968 catalog. About the same time it was really getting ready for the MP5 and they targeted the export market. I think the only people in West Germany that ever acquired a few of these were some police agencies, maybe some border agents, but nothing in the military. Export, though, was, was reasonably good. Just not compared to the G3 and the MP5. He was just that metal child. I used to sell a lot of guns for Vector, and they had a lot of kits out of Malaysia. So they actually produced or at least assembled some under license there. Thailand adopted a version, again producing it or at least assembling under license, is the Type 11. Lots of other nations would buy them in relatively small numbers. Greece comes to mind. They would be nominally made in France by MAS, but actually these were rebranded German guns that were just assembled and proof tested in France for various political legal reasons. And uh, there would be some countries like England that would actually use the HK-53 variant, which became very popular, but we'll get to that in a bit. Just talking about the standard 15.4 inch full length gun right now. If you look at the list of users, it looks quite extensive, but the truth is most of them only had a few hundred or a few thousand. Interestingly, while it took them a number of years to actually put them in production, MK in Turkey started building a variant of the HK-33 in the 1990s. In fact, we had a few come in as the Z-43, and uh, back when those come in, they sold for shit. They were horrible. Uh, good guns. I really like the gun, but... You just had to beg people to sell them. Their um, their their nine mils sold all day long, but no one wanted the Z forty three back when they were available. They got so bad that the price dropped to twelve hundred dollars brand new just to just to move them. But I digress and move forward. So throughout the seventies, they do sell these, and there are some updates that all kind of get folded into what's un informally known as the HK thirty three E. 
For example, quite soon this fingerprint was added to the bolt carrier to act as a very crude but also very effective forward assist. Before that, you just used a hole here and that's where a bullet tip could fit in. But they added this fingerprint to kind of make it easier. Interestingly, the fingerprint concept seems to have started in Sweden or Norway because some of their early guns like the AK-4 had that. And then you see things like the wide handguard coming about, changes to the bolt group and stock. Of course it has diopter rear. For some reason this one has a different rear notch. This is very clearly a shooter gun. Of course originally they had the steel lower with the SEF marked trigger pack for safe semi-full. And there would be a variant known as the HK33K, which was exactly the same gun except the barrel was shortened to here at roughly 13 inches, give or take. And that dropped the overall length down to about 34 inches. And they usually would have a collapsing buttstock as well. I don't have an HK33A3 stock. Here's an MP5A3 stock though. Very similar single pin. Really just the difference in the buffer and a few other small things. And of course there are lots of stock changes over the years, but usually the 33K was a 33KA3. In fact, I think almost always. They didn't actually start putting this stock combined with a full length barrel until much later. Basically the idea was full length barrel and fixed stock or chop the barrel down to about 13 inches and put a collapser on to save some some length. With this collapsed in it let the gun be about 27 inches a little less. It really was about the same weight though because the stock is heavier than the plastic so even though we're saving a couple inches on the barrel we're making up for it by having a heavier stock. So we're still a heavy gun, but these are reliable. They're simple to disassemble, maintain. That said, they are very dirty runners. Like most all HKs, you can lock it open here, but that's your only bolt hold open. It's manual, not automatic. And uh, this of course, being a blowback delayed, it has a fluted chamber and uh, they can be exceedingly dirty, at least compared to some other guns. Of course, the HK slap is very famous. I've never been a big fan of it, but to each their own. And in the original gun will have a paddle release. HK would keep these in its catalog for a number of years. In fact, they didn't officially discontinue it until 2000. Although, frankly, further development of the HK-33 or HK-33E, if you prefer, with a few updates, really stalled out in the 70s in favor of this newfangled thing called the G-11. But we'll revisit that later. I think it's time to talk about semi-autos themselves now, don't you? So let's get to that. It would take... A very long time for military style semi-autos to really become popular in America. Not because of the government, but because of the population, at least in the beginning. So I brought this out. This is one of the first military semi-auto types to come in and one of the first roller delayed. This is of course my Spanish Setmi Sport or Sporter imported by a company in Chicago Mars These started to come in around 1964 and only were imported until about 1970 and only about 1200 came in They just weren't that successful. They were expensive but people weren't really looking for a military style gun. Now full disclosure, I've changed mine a small amount. I've replaced the 
rubber mil uh, kind of sporter butt pad that said set me and had corrugation with the rubber military one. I've got the original, don't worry. And these did not come in with the bayonet lug, but you could just pop it in. They did actually have the grenade ring on the barrel, and they had the threaded barrel with flash hider. Handguard. And they never had the paddle mag release. Although interestingly, they did have the pinned lower. The pin itself was moved back so that a full auto pack would not fit in. They also dimpled the outer pack and other changes. One change they made that I can't really reverse is they put these non-standard scope mount types on top instead of the claw mount but it's a Spanish made set me some auto and actually the only one we've ever been blessed to receive these are very high quality guns now there were some very few HK G3 some autos imported around the same time that's a gun I'm not rich enough to own even if one fell into my hands I'd be selling it. Not because they're not great, but because they command ridiculous money. That kind of sets the stage for when in 1968, HK prepared to bring over what was known as the HK-43. The 4 designated a semi-auto, kind of paramilitary type gun. The idea was that they could be given to conscripts before they went into the military service and they could learn with them some auto, kind of like the Romy G AKs. And of course they wanted to bring some over to America. So they actually sent a few samples over, at least two, in 1968 for approval. But then the Gun Control Act happened and so they had to kind of go back and make more changes. The early 43s, like this, had pinned lowers. Well, the ones we ended up with, this introduced the shelf system that we actually have on several guns even to this day. They also would drop the bayonet ring on the barrel because the 68 had a thing against grenade launchers. Did I say bayonet? I meant grenade ring. Either way. They would drop that for the 43. They had actually retained the bayonet lug, although of course it's just the small springy thing in here, so you can put one on anyway. And they retained the flash hider. And they initially retained the original 15.4 inch barrel, something that actually didn't get caught until after importation. So anyway, they sought approval. Seems like samples were again sent over around 71, 72. And then in early 1974, the first HK 43s hit. Now, these were not imported by HK themselves. At that time, they didn't have a US company. They were actually imported by Seiko. Not that Seiko, not S A K O, but S A C O, Security Arms Corporation in Arlington, Virginia. They handled the 43, also the 308 version, HK 90, actually 41. And they actually shipped the first guns with the 15.4 inch barrel <laughs> and their removable flash hider. They had to do a recall and permanently affix, pin, or weld the hider on, which actually brought the overall barrel length to 16.9 inches. So in some ways, if you count that, the HK-43 has a longer barrel than either the HK-33 or the HK-93. Also, fun fact, that was right around the same time the minimum barrel length was changed for rifles from 18 inches to 16. So, yeah. Of course, by that time, the Mars Setmes were long gone, and much the shame. It's a shame we never really got more. Spain was doing its own thing. So, we ended up with the HK-43, but it was very very short-lived. In fact, HK Germany only built about 377, and of those, it's estimated that about 200 
made it into the USA in that first batch. But HK had plans afoot, and they wanted to improve their kind of public image. Towards the end of 1974, the name was changed to HK-93. They thought maybe the 43 had too much of a military connotation. They were trying to do kind of a new sporter line. The truth is there was only one big change between the 43 and the 93 of note. They went to a new 16.125 inch, so you know, a little over 16 inch barrel and threaded removable flash hider. Also, I should point out that all HK 43s had the slim handguard, not the wide, and all came in as A2s. The HK 93 would soon get the wide handguard, which could take the bipod, and they would offer both an A2 and an A3 version. All HK 43s had kind of a black matte finish. The 93 it started to appear with more of a gray green finish, although some also had black finish. The reason this gun is kind of neat, it's an early 93. Because it still has the Seiko, S-A-C-O, security arms import marking. In 1975, HK made moves to establish their own company. And by 1976, HK-91s and HK-93s were marked HK Incorporated, Arlington, Virginia. They also changed the way they marked the receivers, adding Cal, K-A-L, German spelling, 223 to them. They changed the date code system. Before, they just used numbers. Typically, it was a month and year, a two and two digit. And now they would go to the, you know, ABC codes that we all know and love. And all those changes happened around 1976. So this one's kind of neat, and the, well, you know what, in some ways. If it were just a little earlier, it'd be an HK-43. That'd be awesome. But of course, if it were later, it would have the HK ink markings, and that's not bad, but it kind of makes it different. And for a couple of years, HK-93s would stay the same. But in 1980, there would be some more changes. So let's... um. Let's crack this open and talk about what they did for the 43 and 93 to make these semi-auto only and talk about a couple of the early changes in the 1980s. Then we'll come back and revisit some 70s, although not this one. Here we are apart. If you've taken any HK type gun apart, you know how they go. And there aren't a lot of differences now and then in the 43 and the 93 both introduced this kind of slide on clip on receiver essentially where the pinhole would go they filled it in that was decided by HK more than anyone else to how to make it some auto unfortunately they did take away the paddle mag release meaning we had to rely on the auxiliary release here unfortunate to correspond with that, the lower had to be modified. Originally, they took the SEF and turned it into an SF lower. They actually modified the housing so that the safety could not rotate. They clipped off the front where the pin would go. And inside, as you'd imagine, they removed the auto sear and the trip lever. And because of the way the housing was designed and this, they would not fit back in. Furthermore, they would actually machine the auto sear trip tab off the bottom of the bolt carrier. Again, not just with the 93, but the 43 as well. I'm only pointing that out because typically the myths around all guns is that the earlier ones were easier to convert to full auto and the later ones were not this is not true the 43 and 93 it was really just a name change because hk was thinking about getting into importing them themselves and also they were trying to kind of change their image a little bit but in reality the only 
noteworthy difference aside from different furniture, different markings, the 43 retained the bayonet lug, but of course you could install one in the front, replacing that cap exceedingly easy if and you want to. So that's kind of where it started. And for a couple of years we wouldn't have many changes. In 1980, there would be a change to the HK-33 and HK-93. Originally, the recoil buffer is on the bolt carrier, back here, this thing. And the buttstock was essentially a plastic only. They changed that, adding a metal cap in there and a buffer more in the stock and they removed the recoil buffer from the carrier and that would obviously carry over to the Sima Autos as well. Then in 1982 we get some markings change. HK would start doing for their military guns like a 0, 0120 or 0, 01 infinity or 0, 013 either way more of a numerical marking more of a universal than the SEF this would be carried over to the HK93 the SF would be replaced by a 0, 01 marked lower and at the same time the German spelling for cal K A L on the receiver would be changed to C A L that is cool, unfortunately. Oh well. But for a few years after that, the HK-93 would pretty much stay the same. And the HK-33, well, that was pretty well where it was going to be. Because the G-11 was what HK was focusing on at this point. Alrighty, back together. And... It hasn't been off the shelf. You probably didn't think I even kept one of these. I brought out my HMG Set Me L. It's almost worth keeping one of these for just the weirdness and the story behind them. And it was my first gun and it actually still runs fine. This is of course a kit build, not an import. As I said before we took this guy apart, we're going to kind of revisit Set Me's. Now, you might think, since Spain sent over a semi-auto version of their Model C, that they would send over a semi-auto version of their Model L. Their Model L is an interesting creature. In the 1960s, Spain thought about doing a 223 version, but through political whim and the whole thing being more complicated than they thought, the first prototypes really weren't ready until 1980, trials in 82, and were finally officially adopted in 84, and were funded for full production in 86. It took a while. And even though this is a roller delayed gun firing 223, 5.56, it's actually very, very, very different compared with this. One thing you'll note. And has a very squared off receiver. For another, of course, as a standard, it feeds from what we think of as Stanag mags. Now, in reality, the Spanish mags weren't 100%, but they were close enough that they could usually get American mags to work. Now, no shade on HK when they made the 33 and 93. There was no standard mag at that time. But by the 80s, there really was. Interestingly, dimensionally, they're about the same. The set me is about 36 inches overall, too. It has a slightly longer barrel at about 15.7 inches, but it's a lighter barrel. And this is an overall lighter gun. It's about one pound lighter than the HK, about seven and a half versus eight and a half. It was also cheaper to produce and sell, although that's not always a good thing. So the standard Set Me L rifle was adopted. 
and put into service. They ordered 60,000 initially with plans for more. Unfortunately, its first major combat deployment, the 1999 Gulf, excuse me, the 1991 Gulf War, it didn't prove great. Now, as we know now, it wasn't all the gun's fault. In fact, bad mags and bad ammo played a big role. But its time was short-lived. In fact, not long after further development orders were canceled, and Spain would only build about 100,000. By 1998, they were getting a replacement ready. And, well, by the 2000s, it was out of service. And that's why we have kits. So, what about the 33 and the 93's fate in the 1980's? As I said earlier, the 33 development really stalled out in the 70's because the G11 was supposed to be the new hotness and this would last until the 1980's. And they would make them in small numbers for testing along with their caseless 4.7mm cartridge. But in 1988, costs were getting very, very high, and the death knell came in 89 with the pending reunification of East and West Germany. The Bundeswehr could not afford the G11. Unfortunately, HK could not afford to let it go. Too much time and money had been dumped into it. The Bundeswehr was going to need a new rifle. The G3 was long in the tooth, and they realized the G11 wasn't going to work. They initially proposed, hey, why don't you buy a G11 for frontline troops and the G41 for reservist. What's the G41? Essentially, an HK-33E modified, just freed from Stanag mags. It didn't look like the Setme, but in a lot of ways it borrowed elements like this from it. So, yeah. But the Bundeswehr was not interested. HK's next effort was, okay, fine, just adopt the G41 for everyone. But the Bundeswehr was not interested. This was, it was old technology. It had been left dormant for 15 years in favor of another gun. They weren't interested. They basically said by 1992, 93, we, we want something new. This would result in the HK-50 project, which would result in the G-36 that we've covered on this channel many times. Interestingly, not only did that get adopted in the Bundeswehr to replace the G-3, it was adopted, the G-36E version, in Spain to replace the Set Miel. So, quite successful with that. One problem. HK was going to go bankrupt without help. Now, the German government worked out, but it basically this led to a buyout of the company by British Aerospace in the early 90s, which led to some interesting partnerships and programs, including reforming the L85 in Britain to the L85A2. But I think I've digressed enough there, but it's all interlinked, and that was kind of the end of the 33, which is why it was officially pulled from their catalog in 2000, although in effect, the full auto version hadn't been sold in a very long time. The semi-auto, though, was still going strong in the 1980s in America. In uh, 1988, the HK Incorporated would move to Chandler, Virginia, to a new new location, a bigger location, so the real mark, the import mark, would change. But more importantly, the gun itself would get a somewhat major update. The receivers would be marked 5.56 instead of 2.23. This wasn't just a name change, it was a barrel change. Up till now, up till 1988, they had the 1 in 12 twist. But now they start to receive the 1 in 7. So for NATO. And you can actually tell this on the barrel if you pull your handguard off to see if you have one. If it has the 556 marking and the alternative Virginia address, it'll say 178 on the underside of the barrel, which is basically 1 in 7 twist, but in millimeters. I just thought I'd share that. Unfortunately, this last run would be cut short because in March of 1989, George H. Bush would sign an executive order banning importation of so-called assault rifles, assault weapons for civilian market. 
which meant even if Spain wanted to, they weren't going to send us a set me L semi auto after this. So that was the end of that. Now, HK would get around this for a time in the 308 arena with the HK 911, the 91 added with another one, and some other things, but they pretty well just dropped the 223. It had not been selling as well. In fact, between 1974 and 1989, only 18,299 of these were imported. Compare that to roughly 50 to 60,000 HK41, HK91s. You can tell which was the more popular. Of course, back then, the least popular was the HK94, unless you count the SP89 pistol, which was the least popular of them all. It was also really the only pistol in this family that we got. Back then, the whole idea of doing a pistol version just hadn't caught on. In fact, it was that 89 ban that would eventually inspire the, the pistol arena. And speaking of, I want to do one other little comparison before we wrap things up. Since we showed a HMG, it only seems fair to show off a Mark Omar before we end this video. This is, of course, my LC. And I wanted to bring it out. Remember how I mentioned that HK33K A3? This is Spain's version. Very different again. Very different style of stock. But it ends up having almost identical dimensions. This has an extended muzzle device for legal reasons to get it to 16. But like the German, it had about a 12.6, 13 inch give or take barrel. It was slightly longer with the stock deployed at about 37 inches. But actually when you uh, collapse the stock in, because of the whole nature of the system, with that short barrel, it ended up being slightly shorter at about 26 inches compared with about 27. And of course it's still fed from AR mags. It was obviously slightly heavier because of the steel stock. Like the 33K, it could not mount a bayonet or fire rifle grenades. But it's kind of neat that they both produced a little compact carbine. But of course, that's where Setme stopped. They didn't do a submachine gun sized. HK Wood with the HK 53. It's a shame we never get an HK 53 pistol. Essentially, think MP5, but firing 223, 5.56. Those are actually very, very popular. You couldn't find many under 10 inch barrel, even under 11 inch barrel ARs that were reliable in the 70s and 80s. It had an 8.3 inch barrel, was actually quite reliable, quite handy under 7 pounds, and uh, could collapse down with the stock in to 22 inches. They ended up having to give it a four prong flash hider because of the blast, but still, nevertheless quite successful you see a lot of special forces units using them including in england uh, the the english the sas specifically used the hk 53 for years as did uh, other police agencies but that's a story for another day i'll have to get my hands on a build vector had them century did a version but unfortunately there's no true uh, pre-man import and the uh, Zenith Z43s were more like an HK33K with a 12 and some in some odd inch barrel, not the super compact one. But it is a neat gun, and we'll cover it one day. But, you know, that's kind of uh, enough here just to drop a dime in your ear about it. I've been selling Marco Morris at me's for a number of years, and people, rightfully, really think they're just HK-33s but built in Spain. After all, the Setme Model C and HK-G3, while not always interchangeable, are close. Not so with these two. So I thought we would look at them disassembled just for a minute since we are comparing and contrasting. Of course, your HK receiver is two pieces with the thing. Looking at our set me receiver 
this is all one stamped piece. It's a square receiver. We'll square it off. And you notice there's a push pin here. All that does is hold the trigger group in. That actually falls out the bottom, leaving this one piece. So it actually is cheaper and a little bit lighter the way they've done it. Looking at the bolt carriers, again, very different shape. You can tell that, you know, there's there's still similar design, some concept. But then notice this has a small recoil spring here. This doesn't have a spring. That's because its spring, kind of in traditional submachine gun, is actually housed in the buttstock, at least <laughs> the majority of it. That's one honking spring. And believe it or not, the Spanish 308s tend to have less felt recoil than the G3s. And in my personal experience, the uh, Set Miel is a little less thumpy than the HK. And I think this big spring and the fact that it's further back in the stock has a lot to do with it. Also, it's held on by two pins instead of one. Again, it's truly a shame we never... We never got a semi-automatic Model L in the 80s. That would have been something. That's why we were so excited when even these HMGs came out. And even more so with the Marco Mars. And Marco Mars are objectively better guns. But there are a few things I actually like about the HMG more, which is why I've hung on to one over the years. And I've talked about that in previous videos. So if you're kind of curious, uh, yeah, search the channel app and uh, I'll give you my reasoning. But with that, let's get them back together and bring this video home. So for those of you who've stuck with me this long, I appreciate it. I know this video is just me been talking, a little bit of disassembling, but mostly talking. Part of it is it's been storming outside all day and everything's wet. Now, I've been teasing with various set me's too. Would it not be fun to do a comparison at the range? This is obviously a shooter grade gun. So actually, this is just part one. In part two, we're going to take the HK93 out, along with one or two set me's. Yeah, even though these are builds, that's what we got. So we'll make do. See how they shoot, see how they feel. Is it possible they're better guns? I don't know. But I wanted to get the history and some of the mechanics out of the way for those interested in that. Part two will be the more action and opinion oriented. We'll do some accuracy testing and what have you. So stay tuned for that. But people have asked me for a couple of years to really focus on the HK33. And since I could, I wanted to give it its just dessert, just do, and, uh, and time. We've done plenty of videos on the G3 and MP5 after all. So what do you think so far? Are you looking forward to part two? Do you own these or a C93 or one of the old Vector V93s? I sure shipped a lot of them back in the day. Quality guns for what they were. And fun guns. As always, if you could, please do like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd really like to help support the channel, so we can get out in the rain, check out the link to the Patreon. Hope everyone has a good weekend, and we'll catch you very soon next time.